Uh, good morning and good evening, everybody, um, and welcome to the latest in our series, Image Complex. My name's Mark Legby, and I'm the director of the Power Institute, and my job uh, today um, uh, is to hand you over to our wonderful uh, guest, uh, Lisa Nakamura, and uh, uh, the convener of the series, uh, my colleague, uh, Nick Crogan. But first, um, I'm coming to you today, and we are uh, hosting this seminar today on the traditional lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I wish to pay my respects to elders past, present and future, and acknowledge all First Nations peoples uh, attending and listening to uh, present on this, uh, at this event. Um, I'm also delighted to welcome everyone back. I hope uh, that the uh, Zoom format uh, is permitting a wide range of international um, participants, but of course it is, uh, uh, also, of course, uh, slightly uh, at the um, uh, mercy of time zones and uh, time. So it's an early morning start for those of you joining us in Australia, and I thank you very much. And it's, uh, of course, uh, getting in the evening for our uh, speaker and guest today. And I'd like to thank everyone for all the accommodations that have made this possible. But and before I hand over now to the the the, the real business of today and to to, to listen to uh, Lisa uh, and Nick. Um, I also want to remind everybody that there, we have some, uh, that though our, our, our lecture series this, this year are uh, online, we do have live events and one of those comes up next week if you're interested and are in the Sydney area. Um, we are organising a panel in association with the, uh, I think, very interesting exhibition Light and Darkness, uh, an exhibition which um, very much foregrounds the Power Collection. Uh, some of uh, artworks which have not been seen in, uh, well, in some, in some cases in 50 years at the Chow Chat Wing Museum on the University of Sydney campus. And I'm hosting a panel uh, on Thursday evening at six o'clock, which is called Psychedelic Promises, which might, uh, might not be self-explanatory. It's actually bringing together scientists, psychologists, and um, art historians to discuss not only the place of psychedelic experience in artistic thinking in the 60s, but also the um, promise that psychedelics and psychedelic therapies are now holding out uh, in, in the last few years, you will all know that uh, psychedelic therapies have suddenly become uh, uh, sort of a, a, a promising uh, antidote to the, uh, the waves of um, uh, depression and other illnesses. And so we have gathered experts, not only uh, art historians uh, who were there, but also uh, 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 veterans of the uh, prescription of LSD in the 60s, and to those who are, ex are who are conducting the experiments today, um, which are leading to new breakthroughs. So anyway, that's all to say that's at six o'clock, and then it's followed by the launch of the wonderful book that accompanies the uh, series, which is uh, Light and Darkness, which we published here at Power Publications in association with the museum. So I hope that some of you may be able to come to that. But now it really is time for me to, uh, to hand over to the convener of our series, Image Complex, uh, Nicholas Corbin. Thank you so much, Mark. Nini Nalawangun Mari Bujiri Gadi Nurada. My name is Nick Krogan, um, and I say these words in the uh, Sydney language uh, as a way of paying my respect as a person of white settler heritage to the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation whose unceded lands um, I'm joining you from today. Um, these words mean we meet together on the very beautiful Gadi country. Um, and while we're meeting online today, uh, these words are also a reminder that virtual space is always bound to material and historical places. Um, as Mark mentioned, today's lecture is the third in a series of public talks that the Power Institute is hosting entitled Image Complex. The term image complex was coined by US activists um, and scholars, Yates McKee and Meg McGlagan, to describe the infrastructure that has arisen in recent decades to produce and circulate the image world that now forms such a dominant part of our lives. The image complex is not just one place or thing, but rather an always shifting network of people, institutions, technologies, and platforms. At stake in the image complex is thus not just the content of what we see, but rather what is seeable and what it means to see at all in the late 20th and early 21st centuries. Image complex points to a longer history of vision, understood as something not universal, unchanging or natural, but rather as the product of distinct historical and political forces. 
This year, we've invited four leading international scholars to help us explore the contours of the image complex. Uh, we've already heard from Mackenzie Wark um, and Zainab Chelik Alexander, um, and you can um, catch their lectures on, on our website. Um, today, we have Lisa Nakamura, and later in the year, uh, we'll be hearing from Tina Kant. These thinkers are, I think, leading a really exciting new wave of thinking about visuality, one that builds on but also breaks from earlier visual culture studies in really important ways. Um, and one of its many strengths is to center perspectives that art history uh, has traditionally obscured. Colonial histories, queer and trans life worlds, radical black aesthetics, and the powerful body of work produced by queer women of color. These thinkers and perspectives allow us to see our contemporary image complex not as an immovable machine, but rather as a complex and unstable assemblage, vulnerable at all moments to rupture by alternative histories and possible futures. So today's speaker um, is Lisa Nakamura, who since the mid 1990s has been a pioneering thinker of one of the key components of our contemporary image complex, the internet. Uh, and in particular, the way it gives rise to new and all too familiar formations of race, gender and sexuality. Uh, Lisa is the Gwendolyn Culvert Baker Collegiate Professor of American Culture at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, um, where she's joining us from today. And she's the author of many, many books and articles, which I can say are really helpfully catalogued and PDF'd on her website. So if you wanted to read through um, all that previous work, you can find it there. Um, but rather than um, dryly list all those, uh, we're going to start today with a short um, interview um, where we'll discuss a little bit Lisa's prior work. Um, and then uh, we'll hear from Lisa's talk, um, followed by a Q&A um, at the end. Uh, and we'd invite you to submit your questions for Lisa using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, and you can also um, upvote and comment on other people's questions um, as well. So. Uh, that's enough of an intro from me. Thank you so much, Lisa, for joining us today. It's a privilege. And um, I'll take this opportunity to say that I speak to you from unceded territory in the state of Michigan, um, territory belonging to the Anishinaabe, Ojibwe, and Potawatomi people. Thanks so much. And uh, could you say a little bit more maybe about um, the, the institution that you're, you're speaking from? Because I know um, at the University of Michigan, you wear many hats uh, in terms of the disciplines um, that you work in. Um, yes, um, the University of Michigan launched a Digital Studies Institute, which is organized around issues of identity, power, and culture. And I'm the director of that. So thank you for letting me blow that horn. I really appreciate it. <laughs> um, it has an undergraduate degree and um, offers courses on race, identity, games, things that students like, but also things that students want to know. Um, mm. And I teach in an American culture department, which also houses ethnic studies. So I can say we're the first digital studies program to come out of ethnic studies in a literal way. So our mm. sisters were Latino studies, Asian American studies, and Indian studies. Mm. I guess it's really worth underscoring how innovative that is. And and who, who are your students in, in, in these programs and courses that you teach? Are they coming from the humanities or are they also coming from... Um, kind of computer science and that's such fields. a good such a pregnant question because um of course we're in the liberal arts most of our students are in the liberal arts but our courses have always gotten a lot of engineers and it's such a pleasure and a privilege to have an engineer because they get one elective so the engineering course in the u.s is considered a vocational track meaning it's got to be accredited so it has mm -hmm. to meet a number of requirements, which are, are quite frankly, based on the 19th century desire not to die crossing a bridge, honestly. <laughs> so they, they really never get to have seminars and so few free choice courses. Um, and they take our games courses. And sometimes they take our courses on code and surveillance and ethics, because I think they're very much more aware that the things they're building could possibly be put to bad use and that they themselves aren't even conscious of the history or the implications of what some of these technologies actually do. Because I think in the practice field, they're quite separated from you know, activity and then consequence or even critique, right? So mm. they're often um, the most engaged students that we have because they're so um, 
curious and sometimes apprehensive about where the digital is taking us. You know, mm -hmm. so in the last 10 years, I've seen that big turn where at first um, there was a, a little bit of an allergy to talking about race, especially in technology. Those were seen as two opposite things, not even as two unrelated things, but one will cancel out the other, meaning with technology, we won't have race anymore. Either mm. we won't see it or there'll be some way to solve for it, mm. right, to to eliminate it from social interaction or political salience. We'll find some way to hide it. Um, but I think, especially since 2020, that is not what you hear. Mm -hmm. well, actually, that's interesting because I did want to go back to that kind of earlier moment um, with you today and, and talk about um, your first two books, which have been so influential. Um, from 2002, there's a book called Cybertypes, and then 2008, um, Digitizing Race, Visual Cultures of the Internet. Um, and the opening line of Cybertypes is, the internet is a place where race happens, um, which I guess for many of us in the humanities today seems um, almost um, obvious, but at the time that was not an obvious thing to say, right? The, the field of cyber studies was not talking about race. Yes, I think it's fair to say many people weren't using the internet in the 90s really. And um, it was quite, seen as quite a functional technology for a while. So email was a requirement eventually, but I think what you see now with Roblox and Minecraft and, you know, social media where it's an everyday, it, you know, part of social life and of interacting, that was not even something that wasn't happening. I don't think anyone imagined it would happen. Mm. So it was kind of excluded from the future from the beginning. <laughs> Partly because it was so difficult to imagine what that would actually be like, you know, who would pay for it, what kinds of devices would be involved. There had already been a crash, you know, the 1990-2000s crash, um, and there was a big um, sense of apprehension that this was another fad that was going to flare up and then disappear, and it was nerds and hobbyists. So I think we've mm. seen the, you know, the kind of... Um, interpolation of nerds into everyday life where that's not a stigmatized identity anymore. I mean, just following the, the trajectory of someone like um, Bill Gates or Mark Zuckerberg, it's instructive in and of itself, like new forms of masculinity were being created at that time. Um, but mostly when I look back on it as a historian of technology, um, there was very little history being done in the early days because it was something that was seen to have just begun. And I mm. think work by people like Alex Galloway and Lev Manovich in the 90s really showed that that history is older than people thought it was. It didn't start with the first personal computer. It started instead with all kinds of media that were utopian, mm. right? That were um, global, you know, had different kinds of claims to doing mm. things. Um, so- uh, uh, and, and part of that yeah. utopianism in the 90s was especially in the US and the kind of uh, Clinton Gore moment was a, a sort of post-racial utopianism, um, right? That the kind of the internet was going to um, kind of overcome the, 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 the color line, um, as Dubois puts it, to, to overcome the problem of race entirely. Um, right, And that's something right. we're writing I against. Yeah, I was um, thinking very much about the idea of the neoliberal subject who gets to choose everything but pays for every choice. You know, the thinking was that if you could use the internet to hide your race and gender, wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? You know, um, so that's neoliberal choice, right? You get the, the, the you get to hide your identity as part of the bargain of being on the internet. So mm. um, in the '90s, it was a kind of multicultural moment where there was a lot of women of color literature being taught. I think we often don't remember. That, but if you were, say, a student at the City University of New York um, in the mid '90s, you were probably reading *Sister Outsider* by Polly Marshall, and you know it was the representation moment where we were reading things by people we hadn't already read. But technology was seen as separate from that. Mm. So um, I think in advertising for the internet in the '90s, you could see all this colonial imagery of grabbing this space that this is a frontier and, and we're gonna own it as Americans. 
Mm, and everybody cowboys. else is going to follow. Exactly. And everybody else is going to follow, but get to be there as an exotic reminder of a pre digital past. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's long since the time where the US was a dominant user, English is a minority language on the internet. Um, but those agenda setting moments in the 90s so perfectly overlapped with the kind of waning empire of the US, right? It was kind of recreating this newer empire that was somewhat abstract and notional, but turned out to be so much bigger than people thought. Mm. And I, I wanted to ask actually about that, because um, you mentioned there was sort of one um, body of scholarship that you were um, you know, contributing to, which is the, the history of media and, and digital media, in particular folks like Galloway and, and Manovich and so on. But then um, part of what made your work so innovative was, was joining that to another um, kind of lineage of thinkers um, like Chayla Sandoval, um, Donna Haraway, Gloria and Tildua. Um, could you say a bit about the kind of influence of those thinkers on, on, your, on your work in that period? Yes, for sure. Um, I've been so impressed and struck by the return of women of color feminism from the 70s. So Donna Haraway, Chela Sandoval's Donna Haraway student, also Audre Lorde is writing during this period, um, but they're getting completely different audiences who are not exactly talking to each other all the time. So I think forms of anti-imperial critique were circulating then, but the internet was seen as a little bit external to that. So, you know, capitalism is being critiqued, patriarchy is being critiqued, technology is not yet seen as part of patriarchy or capitalism. And I think in the two, you know, in the thousands and in the 2010s for sure, um, there became more awareness that, you know, Cambridge Analytica is actually, you know, an example of the power of the patriarchy and of um, capitalism to completely twist processes that people thought were kind of too strong or too powerful or too sturdy to be ruined that way. So I think for scholars of internet, it was a moment where finally people were very receptive to, well, how is it do you, that you think the digital is destroying, you know, human relations, right? And there's a deep history of writing about that, but it's just been kind of on the margin. Mm. And I wanted to point um, our audience to um, a great article you recently wrote with Cassius Adir about um, the the digital afterlives of um, The Bridge Called My Black, um, Back, which was a really kind of key book from 1981 um, that collected a lot of those important essays um, by women of colour. Um, because um, I'd like to get to your talk, um, I just have a couple more questions um, and then I'll pass you. Um, but I wanted to introduce the idea of visual culture because that was um, another um, kind of formation that emerged in the 1990s, mid 1990s as a new sort of perhaps discipline that was breaking away from art history. Um, and that was at the core of your, your 2008 book, Digitizing Race, um, where you looked at the way that um, internet visual cultures developed and, and formed categories and types um, of race. Um, could you tell us a, a bit about, I guess, the what, what the visual culture of the internet looked like in that early 2000s period? What were the things that you were, what was the corpus that you were looking at? Uh, such a good question. I was interested in visual culture specifically because it looks at stuff that's not just art. You know, it takes the aesthetic tools and applies them everywhere. Um, and often I think brings them to bear in a, in a really powerful way among things that aren't seen as art at all. So I was interested in instant messenger avatars that young Muslim women were making, for example, partly because they were such a kind of striking um, case of self-fashioning race and gender in a place where it wasn't supposed to be. So when people were using instant messenger, they were kind of stuck with the pre-made avatars that were there, but kids then as now don't settle for that. So I found a really interesting trove of hijabi avatars that women had made, young women had made because they just wanted to use them. And, and you kind of see that practice continuing with emoji. So when emojis came out and they were all of a sudden different colors, people were like, wow, what does this say about identity? Like, well, 
look back 10 years, 15 years, people were doing that then. It's just that the internet wasn't as um, commodified and it wasn't as uniform as it is now. So Facebook sets the agenda for the visual right now, as does Instagram. But in the mm. 90s, that wasn't the case. You know, MySpace could look all kinds of ways and it often did. There was a lot more user um, agency, but the tools were much worse. Um, because, you know, screen sizes were littler and the internet didn't have as big a pipe. So, you know, you had a lot less pixels to work with and things like that. So on the one hand, it was kind of a low res moment, um, which made things very composable for kids yeah. who wanted to just play with, you know, avatars and things like that. Um, I think now though, you have TikTok, which is so easy for kids to make things with and, you know, to make really interesting things. So one of the chapters in the book I'm writing on now is about the women of color making TikTok that's specifically about street harassment and some of the conventions they're using to make these funny and interesting because the currency of social media is funny. You know, um, you have often two modes around um, exposing or, or documenting racism in public, trauma and humor. So I'm interested in, you know, in people who are taking the other path because there's a lot to say about racial trauma in social media. Um, and when people choose not to use it, often they're critiquing the economics of racial trauma on social media. They don't want those kinds of clicks or that kind of attention. So um, mm. I've seen in, you know, of course, since 2020, again, like a real resurgence of women of color claiming those identities in social media too, and saying, this is my contribution to that movement, right? Mm. Yeah, and speaking of, I mean, the, 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 your first two books were um, sort of focused on, the, I guess, that early moment of the internet. And, and now, as you say, the, the texture and forms that comprise the internet have, have changed a lot. And, um, you know, especially in the past few years with the, the COVID pandemic and the kind of Zoomification of everything, of which our talk today is an example, um, it's, it strikes me that it's a sort of a, a trope of, um, of media um, thinking and also thinking about the internet in particular that um, we're always at the moment of the kind of complete um, digitization of everything. So um, in the 1990s, it, it seemed like the internet was going to be everywhere. And then in the early 2000s, well, okay, now the internet really is everywhere. Um, and then in COVID, it seems like, well, okay, so now, now the internet is really everywhere. Now the last vestiges of life that weren't kind of filtered through the web have now been filtered through the web. Um, but I think the power of your work is always to find those places where there's insurgent practices and countercultural practices. Um, has, has the, do you find that the past few years is something quantitatively different um, in the, that longer history of the internet? Yes. Um, I'm gonna be talking today about the metaverse, which claims to break yet another wall in terms of the body's engagement with the internet. Um, it's a massive gamble, obviously, for one of the biggest social media companies in the world. So I'm gonna be talking about some of the marketing of this idea. You know, is there another frontier that needs to be claimed? Uh, somebody thinks so. Um, but as you say, you know, there are women of color, I'm looking specifically at black VR creators who have been challenging this for some time. And um, I'm really interested in how what they do arises from a different logic from racial capitalism and from digital capital. You know, that it's a, um, uh, well, the grant I'm, uh, working on right now with the Mellon Foundation is called Disco Digital in Inquiry, Speculation, Collaboration, and Optimism, partly because optimism is the only choice we have right now. Right? As you say, there's such a thoroughgoing claiming um, and profiting from every form of digital activity that, you know, we've been kind of bringing our hands about this now for 30 years, and there needs to be a movement to handle it. So this book that I'm writing is saying, not only does there need to be a movement, there already is one. It's just not acknowledged as such because the way we define labor automatically already excludes women mm -hmm. and children and old people and many people who do the work that keeps society going on the internet and off the internet. Um, I'm just going to put in the chat a link to the um, Disco um, network um, so people can can read a little bit more about that. Um, 
Um, actually, I think maybe Marnie, if you could do that, I just put it as a message to um, myself and you, Lisa, so <laughs> Marnie yeah. can put that in the chat. But um, look, that's enough from me. Um, I'm sure everybody's keen to hear um, more about um, your, your current work. Um, I'll just remind people that we do have um, time for Q&A at the end um, and scrolling through our audience today. We've got lots of smart people um, in the audience, so please send us your questions. Um, uh, over to you, Lisa. Thank you. Okay. So today I'm going to be giving an excerpt from a book I am writing called Digital Racial Capitalism, Women of Color, Labor, and the Internet. And I've been excited about writing about this period for a, a while. Um, as Nick was saying, my earlier books were pre-social media and even kind of pre-digital online gaming, right? So I've been working around those topics, um, but just haven't put it all in one place. So this work um, is about the labor of non-white people's hands, specifically women, and the value that they produced both before and after the digital and how this labor indexed their lives. Um, as Cedric Robinson writes, um, non Black people's uh, slave labor converted human capital into sugar, cotton plants into cotton, and in the end, produced the data that allowed European owners and investors to rule from a distance, data that feeds what Jonathan Bella calls the world computer. Um, so I'm thinking of Ashil Mbembe's work, but also you know, some of the work by the Sarai and the Rax Media Collective um, to talk about the kind of post-colonial connections to what we now call um, racial capital. So racial capitalism, I'm defining following Robinson, as the foundation of capital or wealth accumulation upon the unfree labor of slaves and other non-compensated non-white people. Um, and in this book, I trace how this is the roots of what I call digital racial capitalism. So if capitalism reserves wealth for specific types of people by excluding many forms of labor and the value that they produce from the category of work, for example, reproductive labor, we saw this a lot during COVID, right? the work of caring for children, educating, cleaning and cooking, maintaining the conditions for life. It's women's labor, it's people of color's labor, it's older people's labor, and therefore compensated poorly or not at all. It's seen as a labor of love. Um, one of the qualities of the digital industries is that they employ fewer and fewer people. Um, actual employment is, is very small. Instead, um, what digital racial capitalism does, like racial capitalism before it, it's founded upon this labor of women and people of color and their simultaneous exclusion from capital accumulation, but with an important difference. So I'm thinking about Seb Franklin, who following Gayatri Spivak defines racial capitalism as differential computation grounded in the concrete violence of dispossession. So digital racial capitalism creates technological and social differentiations within platforms devices, social networks, games, and online activities that gather the labor of racialized and genders users and turn it into capital for use by people in the digital capitalist class. Um, that capital creates and sustains the digital economy. Digital racial capital explains why so many of us produce value for the digital economy, but so few are recognized as employees, as owners, as innovators, and even as contributors. So I focus on the labor of women of color in particular, um, because this is labor that um, challenges the very idea of the digital economy. Um, the labor of using the reporting tools that platforms offer instead of content regulation, or producing the digital environments that nurture the very users that are excluded by digital capitalism, and of making the internet usable, fun, and safe is invisible work it's always been invisible work. And when it's seen, it's often read as killjoy work. Um, since the earliest days of digital networks, when the internet was a default white and US European space in the 90s we were talking about, uh, women of color have provided a viable, attractive and utterly taken for granted alternative to the official diversity industrial complex. So as Nick was saying about an article I wrote with Cass Adair around um, Tumblr and the, the kind of knowledges, situated knowledges, that women of color have shared there about the corpus of 70s writing that empowered um, uh, these people that uh, the diversity complex has existed on the internet for a long time. 
It just hasn't been paid. Um, so um, I'm interested in this moment now where everybody is putting money into the diversity, the digital diversity complex, specifically tech companies. So the big five tech companies um, made significant financial contributions to racial equity after 2020. They committed a total of $3.8 billion toward DEI. And this is from an article in Fast Company based on a report called, we asked 42 tech giants about their DEI initiatives. Here's what we found. So there were varyingly big commitments, um, but interestingly, the percentage of black employees at these companies remained stagnant from 18, 2018 to 2020. So um, in light of this new um, demand for diversity officers, for equity programs, for training, um, the digital racial capitalist complex, um, on the one hand, hires women of color as workers in those capacities, but not as tech workers. Yet at the same time, Tumblr, TikTok, and other platforms have been creating digital diversity work that is indispensable to digital capitalism's growth and models alternative visions that live on the horizons of the possible because they threaten to completely upend business as usual. So I don't see what I'm doing at all is pointing out something new. Um, instead, it's using a trajectory of um, thinking about what is work to start with the um, uh, examples like in 1965, there was a big semiconductor plant on the Navajo um, reservation where over a thousand women made semiconductor chips and other components. Um, and this was celebrated as multiculturalism, right? So women of color's work has always been at the heart of the computing industry. It's just been sequestered or it's been internally colonized. Or as I'm going to say in this book, it's been called, um, uh, it's been called spam or disruption or, you know, uh, killjoy work. So um, critical work analyzing this way that the digital racial capital uses and also tries to destroy these alternative visions deconstructs a mythology of autonomous digital technology. In other words, technology that seemingly arises without this labor, without this uncompensated labor. So in this book, I focus on examples of women of color's digital labor that shows why it is invisible and at times demonized. So I'm going to turn to VR and the metaverse because there's so much um, kind of cultural energy around the metaverse for so many reasons. I'm going to start my slides. So I'm going to start with a 2017 article that appeared in BBC magazine called um, The Virtual Reality That Turns You Into a Black Woman. This was a story covering feminist art collective Hyphen Lab's virtual reality piece, Brooks's Brain Lab, which is one of a suite of technological objects that they um, entitled Neurospeculative Afrofuturisms. So part of that suite included camera earrings intended to record and witness police violence and protests, obviously would have very salient today, um, headscarves printed with anti-facial recognition patterns for protests, again, very prescient. Um, these objects work in two directions. They protect users from surveillance. And in the case of this VR um, uh, piece, they immerse users in beautiful and enjoyable virtual world environments. So when you put on the headset to look at this piece, you see yourself putting on a headset and sitting in a futuristic hair salon. And then there's just some gorgeous imagery, which I'm um, not gonna show right now, but you I encourage you to look at uh, that shows, you know, these really beautiful landscapes and, you know, gorgeous kind of, um, uh, swoopy and nice, you know, utopian images. So the reason this appears in the BBC headline is that when you look at yourself in the mirror in this title, you see yourself as a black woman. So I was really intrigued by the story about the race, race in the metaverse, the headline tells us, because it assumes that VR, because of its intrinsic qualities as a 360 degree sensorial experience, can have real tangible effects upon our sense of what our own race is, that we might forget what our race is. It seems at the same time to celebrate black female representation in VR while representing it as so unusual and so bizarre that it warrants special mention. So this was one of the few pieces that um, appeared both in the kind of artistic and the commercial realm It won the Sundance Award. It's amazing, as I said, it was at South by Southwest, Tribeca Films, 
Um, it then appeared in Meta's or now then Facebook's Oculus store. But that wasn't really what the story was about. The story was asking, quote, why did Hyphen Labs create a virtual reality experience populated exclusively by Black women? So you can see that in the slide. Um, and I added the italics, highlighting racial identities, unexpected and noteworthy presence in virtual reality. So I um, wanted to talk to Hyphen Labs, which is a transnational women of color digital art collective founded in 2014 um, by Etje Tankal and Carmen Wedgie Aguilar. So in 2008, I was able to interview them to get their perspective on why the BBC read their work this way. Um, this isn't the first time that VR has been seen as a shortcut to racial empathy. I'm going to talk about some examples. Um, but in 2018, VR was being repopularized as an everyday technology. Headsets from Sam Samsung, Oculus, Sony, and others were being heavily marketed in that time. Um, and this was also concurrent with the rise of the diversity industrial complex I was mentioning before, and a new awareness of social justice in the tech industry. So there was a need for virtual reality to have a new meaning, um, not only to be a video game peripheral and affordable thing for people to do at home, um, but also Facebook's massive investment is rebranding itself as a virtual reality company, created a new cycle of technological storytelling about the future of social media. So if you've seen, if you've been following this kind of Zuckerberg industrial complex, he's been saying that um, social media and particularly mobile media has a limited shelf life and that we're only gonna be wanting to look at little screens and poke at little buttons for so long and we'll eventually be using augmented or um, immersive media instead. So I wanted to talk to these women because I wanted to see if there was any overlap between the way they saw their labor creating actual virtual bodies that reflected their own and the assumptions that VR could solve digital social problems through race swapping. So I'm going to show another slide that um, this is from that period that gives a little bit of context maybe on why Mark wanted Mark Zuckerberg wanted to change Facebook to Meta. Um, you'll recall during this period, um, Facebook was getting into a lot of trouble because it had been shown pretty conclusively that it was spreading hate speech and misinformation. That instead of connecting people, it was causing some serious toxicity <laughs> and people were really suffering from that. So to pivot to something called the metaverse, another term that's been around for a long time, um, is a way to give a new meaning to something which was already seen as racist and problematic. So positioning VR as a technology of racial empathy made the technology appear to have authentically invested in addressing racism in the world and by extension in those companies, right? Um, so it positioned racism as an individual rather than an institutional problem. If we watch enough VR that turns us into something else, we won't have to change institutions or practices or even products. Instead, people will change their opinions. So this idea of changing user opinions using media um, and specifically immersive media is finding its footing here. Um, and some current manifestations like a company called Mersion, I, I, I'm going to talk about them a lot more. Um, they use virtual world um, motion capture and voice actors to allow white workers to impersonate people of color as part of immersive diversity training. Um, so as you see, this headline says, this is blackface, white actors are playing black characters in virtual reality diversity training. This overlaps with COVID where more people are working from home and um, you're starting to see, you know, real problems with interpersonal racism um, in recordable media and in visual media, right, in, on Zoom. What this did, however, was take away one of the only sources of employment for people of color at technology companies, which is to say as diversity workers. So there's lots of problems with digital blackface. It shows us one of the um, digital racial capitalism complexes, New Horizons, in the age of virtual worlds. In keeping with earlier histories of digital media development that stole, concealed, and later disavowed or even punished women and people of color's labor, building technological systems, calling out toxicity, um, creating their own kinds of content, which was often vilified, um, uh, that this labor is used as a way to get rid of it. So the diversity industrial complex needs people and women of color as totems 
to make visible an institution's commitments to anti-racism. What virtual reality as used by immersion does is to um, extract the value of women of color by making them prosthetic again. So um, in the end, I'm very interested in the conditions of labor. I think that is often left behind sometimes when we talk about the digital and the visual. That's why I wanted to talk to some of these um, hyphen lab members about what they made and why they made it. Um, I also want to note that there's been some, um, a little bit of research into what it feels like to be a white actor cosplaying as a black character in order to endure racial insults or to give them so as to train people in um, how to be more diverse. And as you might expect, people absolutely hate those jobs, right? They find them unpleasant, icky, even traumatic. And in this longer piece, I compare that kind of work to the work of say content moderation, where you have to expose yourself to traumatic racial, you know, or violent content so that other people don't have to, right? You're kind of taking out the trash for people or being even a digital kind of sin eater. So this kind of work is, is, um, is not right, right? It's, it's wrong in many ways. So what is it that women of color think about making VR? Uh, what Ashley Back has told me is that their goal was not to turn um, viewers into black women. Instead, what they were trying to do was empower black female audiences. Back has said, we're simply trying to change the perspective of people that engage with black narratives and black women. Negative portrayals dominate media discussion, especially around violence committed on black male bodies. We wanted to place black women in positions of power. So while well, the BBC story assumes that VR has the effect on users of creating a sense of racial embodiment and helping them to understand what it means to be black by becoming black, um, these creators don't see what they're doing as creating that at all. It's not about empathy. Instead, as Carmen told me, they do it because, quote, they had no choice. This is our job and our work. Our work is self-powering and that is important, end quote. Like so many feminists and BIPOC art collectives working today, they pay for this art by working as consultants, designers, and software engineers even. Um, they see this as a labor of love, but also as a structure of support for other people coming up. They're not making this to, fill, to meet the needs of white viewers for personal racial enlightenment or for companies to assign as diversity training. Those I'm gonna argue in my book, looking at something like this as diversity training is better than employing immersion in many ways, partly because it's not created as a commodity that's meant to um, appeal to institutions looking to improve cosmetic diversity and to profit from that. Instead, it embodies what a viable alternative to digital racial capitalism might look like, created out of passion, self-expression and support for other people. That's the intention, right? So virtual reality is, as David Parisi, a media historian, writes about haptic technology, treated as exotic, foreign, and futurological, even though it's been here for a long time. Um, it's something which is old, but also perpetually new. And I'm gonna talk about one reason why it's perpetually new and what it's doing now. Um, just last week, the FTC um, released a press statement that they were seeking to block Meta's acquisition of a popular virtual reality app um, uh, or app creator called Within. The reason that FTC Bureau of Competition Director John Newman said the acquisition is illegal is because Meta already owns the technology's dominant hardware platforms and key titles because they acquired Oculus in 2014. They acquired Beat Game Studio, which um, made the really popular game Beat Saber. All these fitness apps were very popular during COVID, obviously, when no one could go to the gym. And that buying within would stifle competition. So here's some text from this. Um, as part of its argument that Meta is buying its way to the top rather than competing, the FTC also alleges that Meta and Zuckerberg are planning to expand Meta's virtual reality empire with this attempt to illegally acquire a dedicated fitness app that proves the value of virtual reality to others. After decades of false starts, the fate of virtual reality is the contest to produce a convincing cape for its value. In this chapter, I trace the trajectory of VR as a technology that needs the three-dimensional bodies of women of color both in its advertising, in its media and documentary content, and above all, in its diversity work. So women of color are that killer app in a lot of ways. 
that are um, that Meta anyway is posi positioning as a convincing case for its value. Um, when black bodies are voiced and act by white workers who are exploited by digital blackface, this is yet another instantiation of digital racial capitalism, uh, making this uh, activity deniable, but also helping people to profit from it. So Mersion was a company that predates um, COVID by a lot, and it's not really a virtual reality company. It's more like Second Life. What they do is create real-time diversity training. So it didn't start out doing diversity training. It started out giving people feedback on their teaching and um, things like that. So be able to custom create avatars of different races and different genders and different ages was seen as a feature um, just to help people get experience working with different kinds of students, say. Um, but after 2020, um, they really pivoted and, and they started as early in 2019 to advertise simulations for diversity and inclusion. In other words, rehearsing um, race and racism in order to give people feedback on it. So this land grab really got underway in this period, but even before then, before Facebook rebranded itself as Meta, um, there was a whole kind of canon of VR titles about refugees, homeless people, imprisoned people, transgender people, slaves, and women of color that identified VR headsets with empathy. So um, the cardboard headset, which some of you might have gotten with the Times, came packaged with a bunch of content on Syrian refugees. So you could experience what it was like to be a refugee. Um, in 2017, Google immersed its first VR episode, and it was not really VR. It was you know 360 video, but they chose to launch it with um, a series about racial identity. Um, here's a title that appeared um, slightly before COVID. And what's interesting about this one is that it says, VR helped me grasp the life of a transgender wheelchair user. Now, this title for, um, it's called The Circle, uses VR strengths and weaknesses to help you be someone else. This wasn't even actually produced. <laughs> um, it made headlines simply because it said it would put people in the shoes or in the chair or in the body of a transgender wheelchair user. So the real commodity here is the idea of identification, um, acquiring an identity. So I call this virtuous virtual reality, right? Well, people are actually probably using porn and playing games more than they're doing anything else. Launching this technology as being intrinsically about empathy was a way not just to sanitize it, but to help Facebook meta to rebrand itself in a different way politically. So I'm gonna show a commercial that came out um, in 2019, it's for Oculus. And it will show, I think, how it recapitulates a lot of these ideas about um, race swapping, but also empathy. So I really had to show that because this feel like it was made in 1990. Um, it really shows how women of color's virtual bodies are a foundational part of the industry's attempt to open your eyes to the value of virtual reality. Um, they appear throughout 
this um, video as the U addressed throughout stands very close to black mourners at a candlelight vigil, a kind of uncanny, you know, prescience, I think, before 2020, as the U address stands um, uh, near an Indian man beating a drum at a ceremony, at an Asian drag queen touching up their makeup before a show, implicitly including you as an intimate and welcome participant in a parade of racial and gender difference, very multicultural. Um, Open Your Eyes uncannily produces the same global village imagery that early internet companies like MCI pushed, pushed in the 90s. However, there's a real difference because of the moment. They identify themselves with a DEI mission by representing in much more direct terms what the Oculus headset can provide politically. So while these earlier discourses claim the internet could turn you into a different race or gender role, role playing that felt real but wasn't real, the Oculus Go commercial shows you that VR can bring you to racialized spaces like indigenous rituals and street protests and vigils, mourning the deaths of people to color to make you feel in your body why racism is wrong. So um, I talked a little bit about how VR, you know, has been identified with virtuous racial experiencing um, even before that. But here's another example of how the language of being shoulder to shoulder of being close to or being with or being um, intimate with the racialized body has been part of this discourse throughout. So Google made a series of 360 videos showing how they had black workers, gay workers and working class workers and letting you go into their houses with this 360 video. And the language of the shoulder to shoulder, I think is really important here. The VRs a technology of intimacy, which capitalizes on the labor of women um, people of color as diversity workers. Um, so in some of the refugee content in particular, as you're watching people um, struggling onto the shore as they leave Greece or being in camps, you're often seeing people's intimate individual spaces, their beds, their clothing, sometimes their laundry, their children. Um, there's no notion that this labor um, needs to be protected in any way, or even that it is labor. It's seen as an emotional resource for white viewers. So I want to finish by talking a little bit more about what Black women are doing in the metaverse and how this represents an alternative to that. Digital racial capitalism thrives upon and in fact requires corporate diversity work because as Roderick Ferguson and Grace Hong put it, what corporate diversity work does is to incorporate and contain the disruptive effects of racial and gender difference. So Sarah Ahmed writes about this as well. Um, and the market for racialized experiences has really grown recently as part of that industrial training complex. Um, Kimberly Springer defines the um, diversity industrial complex uh, as, oh no, this is Williams. Uh, Williams defines the industrial complex as the standard approach of making token hires, offering sensitivity training, setting up mentoring networks and introducing other incremental changes that focus on altering women's behavior to say, make them better negotiators. So Hyphen Labs and other women of color creatives doing VR work like Stephanie Dinkins, who I talk about in this work as well. Um, I really recommend her show of Love and Data. It's beautiful. It has some VR pieces in there. Um, create uh, work outside of racial digital capital because it can't be interpolated and in fact isn't being used as part of the approach to diversity. Um, uh, so the mechanism by which racial and gender hierarchies result in women of color not being compensated or given credit for their work in the digital economy because it's seen as natural. Of course, people complain when someone calls them, you know, racial slurs um, as their choice. You know, if you choose to be um, racialized in public, then you're going to be harassed. Um, is motivated by traits that people already have, even traits of care. So I write about how in the 90s, many people volunteered to help people with their homework on AOL. There are a lot of them were kids and older women. They, this was seen as not something you had to pay for. It was seen as love and empowerment, natural kind of traits that women had. So replacing women of color as Mersion does with white workers takes the only career path into the digital industries, um, the diversity space, um, hastened by the coronavirus, um, out of the realm of, of work, right? So for people of color, this is more of the same in terms of dispossession of body and experience. So I lean into the work of women of color VR creators 
not because art is more virtuous in industry, even though obviously you have more leeway when it comes to art than you do in industry, but rather because the uses to which industry puts diversity, especially the digital industry put diversity, um, already always already exclude this form of labor. Um, so I see what they are doing, Hyphen Labs, Stephanie Dinkins, others, um, the form of digital labor that their building practice takes is outside of digital racial capitalism and models an alternative to it. So I am going to stop here if people have questions or comments. I welcome them very much, but I wanted to stop with one recent interview from, I think it was two or three years ago, about another justification for why we need virtual reality in order to train ourselves around racism. So the CEO of Mersion said in an interview, there's so much nuance to interpersonal communication, especially in stressful circumstances. At some point, we may not need humans, but for the foreseeable future, we're depending upon our simulation specialists to deliver the cognition and empathy that AI can't do. So I, this is another example, I think, of the kind of, um, you know, extension of platform capitalism into all areas of life, right? Interaction, cognition, empathy. At one time, these were seen as provinces where AI didn't have to be and wasn't going to go. Um, but instead, you know, what Mersion is, is trying to do is to say we can replace Black humans with white humans and eventually we can replace all humans. So I'm going to stop there and thank you very much.